Welcome to the BIF Talks of this 35th Braunschweig International Film Festival. My name is Clara Hense and I have the great privilege and pleasure to be holding the BIF Talks, which are talks with directors, actors and other guests of this festival. We want to have a closer look and open dis discussions about the films that we will be showing here and to get to know the people behind those films. And those are, for example, Caroline Katz. Welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Which film are you showing here? I'm showing Delia Derbyshire, The Myths and the Legendary Tapes. Um, and that's a film that we made just before COVID and edited all the way through COVID. <laughs> yeah. That was lucky, yeah, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, really lucky. We got it shot just in time, um, you know, just a literally a couple of weeks before the lockdown in Britain. So I was very relieved that we managed to do that and get through it, yeah. And now you're back in not the lockdown situation, back at a festival. How, that does, how does that feel, first of all? Yeah, it's really great to get the film to meet audiences, finally. Um, it's brought, been broadcast in um, Britain on the BBC, um, which was fantastic when it went out in May. So it reached a, te a television audience, but it hasn't reached um, a sort of cinema audiences until all the festivals have started up. Because last year it, it was all film festivals were, you know, online. So this is really, really amazing to sit with audiences and experience the film. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Yeah. Your film will be screened in the sound on screen section. Can you imagine why? <laughs> no, that might be a rhetoric <laughs> question, but no, for real. I would love to talk about sound and screen and the relation between those two. Um, Zida Derbyshire, she was a great um, artist. Um, she was also called the godmother of electronic dance music. Would you classify her as a godmother as well, or maybe as a mother? Well, My relationship with Delia started when I was a, a child, so it, she was, and I didn't realise this, because she was the, she realised the Doctor Who theme tune, and Doctor Who in Britain and kind of globally is really a huge thing, and has been for many, many years, um, and so when I was growing up, that theme tune used to terrify me. I used to be more scared of watching, to this, listening to the sound of the, of the intro than I was actually watching the programme. It was terrifying music. It just sort of set the whole thing up. This whole world would open up. Um, but it wasn't until my 20s that I realised that this, there was this amazing woman behind the sound uh, because her name wasn't on the credits. There was no way of knowing this until... Um, I think it was, yeah, just before she died, uh, some releases came out from the Radiophonic Workshop, which was at the BBC, which was this experimental sa electronic sound studio um, that used to sort of service all the um, kind of television programmes and radio programmes at the time. Um, you know, it was quite experimental. People started to use it when they were branching out with trying to keep up with the sound of you know, European experimental sound. And so we had this very tiny uh, little version of it in at the BBC, but um, I didn't know that Delia was part of that, not until years after. So that was something that I was fascinated with, you know, Radiophonic Workshop, Delia's work, and their process, and her process particularly. So she... I think one of the reasons why she's called the godmother of electronic dance music is because after she died, when they discovered these amazing tapes in her attic, there were all these um, rhythm tracks and um, makeup tapes for various pieces of, that she'd composed. And one of those pieces was, uh, I think it's called Dance from Noah. It's Dance from Noah. And um, the rhythm track of that was something like 159 beats per minute. And she'd created this track, literally cutting note by note, you know, onto tape, splicing bits of tape together. So her process was painstaking and thorough, and she had all this um, kind of... She, it was like she could hear the landscape of all of these pieces in her mind, but there was a, the only way of actually being able to tell if they would work was, was actually physically creating them, um, making tape loops and bouncing the tracks down from you know tape machine to tape machine, 
and yet she, when you listen to these pieces they sound totally effortless so I was really fascinated by her process her mindset what her life story you know how she as a woman managed to st start working at the electronic work uh, the radiophonic workshop in 1962 um, and so after she died in 2001 um, a few years later, her tapes were donated to Manchester University um, and an archive sort of be began there when they started to digitise her tapes. And I went to hear the archive, the beginnings of it, as they were sort of um, digitising it. And I was absolutely transported into these more incredible worlds and terrifying landscapes. I always think of it as a kind of proto-virtual reality listening to Delia's work. It's sort of like she takes you to really strange, strange places and it's sort of beyond something that's ambient. It's just, she has a very, very unique and very melodic way of working. So that's kind of how it all started, how my sort of obsession with Delia began really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you approached this very unusual, inspiring woman, not only as a director, but then also as an actress. How was that, like this double role, interpreting and then directing again? Yeah, well, really that, that sort of, you know, as an actor, it's not unusual to, to research for your roles. You're constantly digging and finding and looking for, for threads and ways into characters. So the process of researching the film, this idea I, I had, you know, from listening to her pieces, that there would be an amazing film to be made that would um, sort of reflect Delia's creative process. Um, the more I sort of researched, the more I found out, the more I discovered about her. It just became a sort of very natural part of that process to go on to play that role, to, um, to sort of a, a sort of an embodiment of Delia in a way because it could never, I didn't want it to be a conventional biopic, you know, so it is very experimental and it's something that it sort of reflects the personalities that people project onto Delia as well and that's, this is my version of that, there's a sort of a fantasy of who she was, she's incredibly enigmatic and there's many aspects of her character that I think um, I, wanted to rem I wanted them to remain uh, mysterious because she is a mysterious person and she is, has many, many um, fans and people that are obsessed and um, really, really knowledgeable about her work and her process and, uh, and quite rightly so, you know, and everybody brings a different story to Delia, so this was sort of my contribution. And I wanted to work with a musician as well to sort of interpret from a sort of le a legacy point of view, somebody that had really worked in a similar way to Delia, that had, had a similar experience as a female composer as Delia. So um, Cozy Fanny Tutti to me was the most, was the obvious choice. And so I was thrilled when I approached her and she was really keen to work on the film with me. And how far would you say your movie contributes to a bigger picture of, let's say, reframing maybe musical historiography of women in music, of their creations? Well, I think it, it definitely approaches a process from a female perspective. Um, and, you know, both Cozy and I are coming from a position of having lived the experience of being, um, you know, growing up in a, in a very male-dominated, in two very do male-dominated industries, music industry and, and the sort of entertainment industry of, theatre and television and film and so we shared a lot of stories and we you know researched a lot about Delia and her experience and the more we discovered and the more we listened to and the more we understood that she did experience a sort of burnout at a certain point um, and I think that was definitely to do with well I think it was to do with the fact that her contribution had was, was downplayed and that she had to fight constantly to be allowed to experiment and to take things as far as she wanted to. And I wondered um, if, you know, it, it was, if the, the male composers at the workshop had as found, found it as difficult as she did, I think. 
to carve a space for themselves. I think she had to find a space within it that was very, you know, she, it was probably quite lonely. Um, so I identified with that, and um, that was something that I wanted to bring out in, in the film. Yeah, so I don't know how it contributes to a bigger picture, but, you know, that I had to come at it very much from, from my own experience. Thank you for sharing that experience and making it possible to live through you, your point of view on Delia. Um, what would you expect from the Q&A today? You will have the, your screening today with a German audience. What about that? I'm really looking forward to seeing, um, just to experience it in a different in a different context. You know, in Britain, you know, the Radiophonic Workshop, Doctor Who, um, is so much part of our culture, and there's a lot of references in it that I think are very British. But I, um, I also think that it speaks to a sort of a bigger a, a bigger story about the creative process. So I hope that it lands well and that people feel, you know, excited and as inspired by Delia as I as I've been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Final question, maybe, about the soundtrack of this film. How did you choose what to include of her, of her work and what not? Yeah, very difficult. There's so many pieces that, you know, I really loved. But, you know, the film's one hour 40. Um, and we had access to Delia's archive, things that, you know... Th that were really, you know, the basis of a lot of her tracks. So that was really exciting. So there was, um, Cozy and I both had this database available to us. We chose some sounds from the archive and we used that as a sort of template. And then Cozy would make pieces of work of her, of, of sort of responding to certain scenes that we were shooting. And in the edit, I would go to this database um, me and the editor would go to this database and together we'd sort of find the right sounds and the right sort of tones and then incorporate um, Cozy's in there as well. So there were, there's Delia's work and Cozy's and it's like the idea of it is that it's um, sort of two composers sort of reaching across eras and having a, a conversation. That's the sort of thing that you don't see. That's the, that's the kind of the, the way the soundtrack is built. Although you do actually see Cozy building the soundtrack as part of it, so that's I hope that's clear in it. Um, but her actual fully, you know, full, the full tracks and sort of Delia in all her glory with everything, you know, as she wanted it to be. I think we have about six tracks that we chose, and they sort of came naturally out of her story and where she was at at a certain part in her in her life. Because she worked not just at the workshop, she worked with other people, she had other, other side projects, so we include those two. Yeah. Well, thank you for this movie. You're also nominated for uh, the Tilda, which is a Women Director um, Award here in Braunschweig. Tomorrow's this prize ceremony. Fingers crossed for you. <laughs> it's we just hope great that you... to be here, and there's such yeah. great films, you know. I'm looking forward to seeing all the films that, you know, well, over the weekend. It's, it's exciting. There's a lot to explore. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Thank you for traveling to Braunschweig. Thank you for sharing your movie with us. It's and such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been me. a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.